All right, well, we'll get started. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for attending this week uh, online and in person. Um, we're going to be talking about the Rani. And maybe, uh, at least for myself, uh, I've subtitled this discussion already as it should be. Um, yeah, there it is. A very complicated cut topic to cover. Um, so, because it, it is, um, I should, it, it's at least complicated for me, only because there is a lot here. Um, and I could do at least two or three more discussions on various aspects of Durrani. Um, that'll be the first reason why I titled it uh, complicated. There's just so much to cover uh, um, with, and to really give it justice within this time constraint. So uh, take today's talk uh, with that in mind. Uh, maybe if it's of interest to people, this could continue into a series if there's a, a warrants more discussion. Um, and this could be considered the kind of introduction to that. Uh, but let me know. Okay. Yeah, there okay, so Durrani, right. Um, what we're actually talking about, um, or for those who don't know, we're, they're, they're chants um, or prayers. We'll talk about issues of translation in a second, but for now, know that we're talking about a type of chanting practice. But again, it, it, it's complicated. So here are some of the factors that I, I draw. I want to draw attention to that really help to complicate things. The first is that a lot is lost in translation. Uh, to many, Durrani are really foreign, not just in terms of language, although yes, uh, but how we perceive them. They have a, a different approach, a, an application, different meaning than and that we may inherently understand. A lot is lost in translation because we may not be used to this type of concept, this, this type of thing. We don't have the right words to describe what Durrani really are. So we'll need to talk a lot about context and to learn to, in order to learn more about what Durrani are. Uh, unless we are, we are practicing or have practiced um, other forms of profound chanting methods, even from other faith traditions, it would be difficult to express what is experienced through this type of practice. Besides, we certainly don't share the same cultural or historical backdrop as Durrani, which greatly does affect uh, how we perceive and use them. Another complicated um, uh, Another complication is how we define them. Uh, as I just alluded to, the words or concepts that we often relate uh, relate to Durrani may misguide our perceptions of them. We do not necessarily have great words to define them, and, and that are that are not without their own ideas baked into what that translation may mean. Like something as simple as calling them a chant already has certain connotations. The other is a recitation. But they're also called spells or codes or uh, incantations, talismans. These words have associations for us that may not translate well. We can also be very broad in how we define what Durrani are. Some Buddhist schools might say that there is an ascribed number of them and they're in various compendium. Um, some others say that there are too numerous to count. And over time also, they have been different. They've changed over that time. Their use and their influence has evolved in many different ways. And finally, they can push us out of our comfort zone. Having to learn how to first contextualize what Durrani are, to find how to define them, just so we can approach them and maybe use them a little better, that is enough of it to cause some discomfort. But then I'm gonna ask you to drop all those conceptualizations of them. That, and you just gotta use them. And that's gonna be weird. It's gonna be foreign, different. We have to drop our ideas of what we think we know about them. They can take us out of that thinking process. And that can be uncomfortable. 
but we have to try it nevertheless. They can help us drop all sense of what we think we know. And I really I had to catch myself, even just in trying to create this presentation and the words that I had to use in trying to relate some of these things. It's tough. So it's just a, a lot to consider uh, going forward. Um, and I hope that my own veil of description uh, doesn't sully that for you. Again, it's complicated, um, but I digress. Okay, context, right. Um, what are they? Buddhist Dharani's origins have long a, a, a history that long preceded them. Um, it dates back to the oral traditions of the early Vedas. Dharani were um, developed. Yeah. Dharani were developed um, out of techniques that have their roots in Vedic mantras. It was held that various sounds were believed to have resonances that would have powerful impacts. Those sounds, um, the, the, uh, those sounds and tones were strung together and to have a spiritual or healing influence, even if the sound themselves had no inherent meaning. Thinking of, think of reciting the Sanskrit Bisha that we do in the Honda, the Om, Ah, and Hum. The sound may be just that, just, just a sound, with no meaning necessarily, but still certainly impactful. Now, I, I kind of liken it to, the, to consider music. Imagine that there are entire albums of music, every note and harmony and lyric had to be memorized. That's the oral tra tradition. Monks were, were doing this with entire sutta, the whole Vinaya, the moral code of the Pali Canon, numerous teachings aside, and all conveyed through long-winded repetition of oral tradition. Some people simply didn't have it. I might call, consider myself one of those. So now imagine that there's a single song that really epitomizes the entire album it, and in all of its beauty and meaning as a, as a way to help convey the entire meaning of the album. Some might call this a mnemonic device, like a way to remember, uh, remembering the great teachings, although that description, I feel, kind of cheapens the song. <laughs> Some of the sounds may be words, and some have meaning. But the words then in context of a phrase, for example, in the chant, may not have the same meaning as the word alone. Or the phrase no longer has any meaning at all. Um, so they may not have any meaning at all. And, and for the purposes of the translation, as we've described, the phrase may have had too much meaning as to have be encompassed into a single comparable translation equivalent. So it's left in the Sanskrit. So there had been a long history of chanting as religious practice well before Buddhism. And however, for our purposes of defining Dharani, they seem to be particularly of a Buddhist um, inception, uh, since Buddhist inception, inception. By their very etymology of the word, it would suggest a Buddhist association because dur is the root word for dharani, um, but this is the same word, root word for dharma. Dur means, or as I'm pronouncing that wrong, I, I apologize, it, but it means to hold, or to support to sustain and maintain, retain, encompass, um, and encapsulate. Durrani first developed as a formula of these sounds, seen as retaining or encapsulating lengthy teachings and doctrines. Thus, the process of developing and using mantra was adopted into the, how Buddhism and Buddhist teachings were first transmitted after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. After all, none of the teachings were being written down until the third count, the Buddhist council around 250 BCE. That's almost 300 years after Shakyamuni Buddha's death. 
up to this point, Dharani were being developed and used. And yes, it did help those who were not able to retain the teachings. But it was originally seen as a way to help those, help those who hadn't learned how not to forget. I think that that's kind of a, a particular way of looking at it. Because if you, if you imagine that you may be sullied, we may describe ourselves as forgetful. So Maximo, in his previous, uh, previous presentation, talked about purity. He talks about purity a lot. If you're more pure, you're less likely to be, to be forgetful. And so the Dharani are a way to get to a place where you don't forget the teachings. And the Dharani, therefore, um, are a way to bring about a somatic state, a meditative state. Once there, the practitioner could have a clearer mind to recall and recite the entire teaching without flaw. Because it set a tone. And eventually, these were being written down along with the sutra. And wherever Buddhism went, it carried these dharani. They're a large part of collection of, in the collection of suttas as part of the Pali Canon, one of the three baskets of the Triptaka of the early Nikaya Buddhism. Migrating south, this would be, later become Theravada Buddhism. And thus, Dharani can be found throughout much of South and Southeast Asia. Those also became important in, uh, uh, Dharani also became important in the development of Buddhism spreading north and northwest. There, uh, this is where we'll spend most of our focus for the discussion because we'll see that Dharani start to become more broad in their development, application, and influence. Pre Mahayana ideas were spreading through at that point with the Gandhara area, which is Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, um, before entering into China around the turn of the Common Era. With this migration came an expanding of the teachings and practices. And, and with the advent of the Mahayana, especially migrating into East Asia, this is where Durrani really prosper in, in prevalence and influence. Through this particular evolution, Durrani developed along with Mahayanist ideas and had even more prevalence within the later development of the Vajrayana or the esoteric tantric Mikyo branch of Buddhism. Now, we could argue why Durrani became so influential during this time, but that's an entirely different discussion um, that would take us way to uh, somewhere else. Anyway, I'll just say that for me, uh, some of the main points to, to think about in, in no particular order and certainly not exclusively, but there was a lot of things going on during this transition of the Mahayana's teachings, changing. This transition of the Mahayana uh, of doctrine was becoming more of a transformative process, a, a visionary type of Buddhism. Foreign influences of Zoroastrianism, the Grecian Empire, uh, Taoism, Confucianism, etc., there's also the expansion of the Buddhist pantheon and having a Dharani for each Buddha and Bodhisattva. The, there is also the, a, a drive to use Buddhism as a means of protection, especially to protect the nation. It is a readily accessible lay-based practice. It can be considered an expedient means to awakening. Some scholars say that, they, uh, that um, Dharani laid the groundwork for the development of Pure Land practice of the Nyamfu or the uh, Nambutsu practice, Namo, uh, Namo Amidabu, and so on and so on. By the sixth century um, in China, Jing Ni Huihuan, a scholar, a scholar monk, classified Dharani into four categories. Um, Dharma Dharani are the teachings, um, and Arta Dharani, we have pulled the meaning, and Mantra Dharani, find as spells, which is interesting, and Kishanti Dharani, the uh, acquiescence. The first two are relate much more to what we're describing as, as we'll call as a mnemonic device, but they're more associated with learning and remembering the teachings. Now, mantra Dharani, here the word spells is really tough. Again, full of various associations, but these Durrani help to uh, help the chanter overcome difficulties or promote health and offer protection. So you can see how we get to the word spell, but I would argue that those chanting them 
did not see it, see it as casting a spell, right? It's not that they were using magic um, and, and it's, or it's like some sort of wizardry. It, it's, it's difficult to characterize these chants within this context with these words. Uh, and, and last, Kishanti Durani, these are intended to aid the Bodhisattva in practice by accepting the nature of reality and encourage them to work for the benefit of others. See these as uh, a way to glimpse into Shunyata, to be reminded of the nature of all phenomena, all dharmas, and what it means to be on the Bodhisattva path. And I love here the idea of Kashanti. This is the perfection of patience or forbearance, which I might relate to in the necessity for, for along the Buddhist path, the Bodhisattva path. Point being here is that these Durrani were well ingrained really early on and had, had a tremendous influence going forward. So as a way to shift gears completely, um, here I want to start by kind of showing you. And eventually, yeah, I'm going to recite one um, so that we can actually know what we're talking about. Um, um, uh, let me see. Yeah, yeah. Here, um, on the slide, you can see my horrible scanning job as I try to perch my Taishikachu on my printer. Um, but this is the Japanese Tendai liturgy book, the Taishikachu. Uh, and within it are several Durrani. What you see on the slide is just a portion of one Durrani. And remember that you're reading in columns from right to left, top to bottom. So, <clears throat> And in this example, you can see that the Japanese characters are on the right. That's the title of the Durrani. And, and, and at the end, the, the Chinese characters for Durrani. Then, let's see, the, this, the, the, the leader will recite the, the title of the uh, Durrani, and then in, in whatever language they happen to, happen to speak, and from there, you start chanting the Sanskrit. That's the Dharani part, if you will. So there's a delineation in, in, in what is translated and what is not. The Dharani is left in its original state, and no translation of it is given. Now, no one other than maybe Ichishima Sensei um, would know how to pronounce these particular Sanskrit characters. So next to the next to the darker um, characters, you see the lighter, smaller little characters, and that's the Japanese syllabary, the katakana, used for foreign words and sounds, which obviously Sanskrit is. In, in this way, those chanting, and in this case, the Japanese, will know what sound to make um, in, in place of that Sanskrit character, for that Sanskrit character. Now, now, I labored the music comparison earlier, but I'll echo it again here, because seeing it and simply reading it is not how you make the music, if you will. Where's the rest of it? You may ha have a sheet of paper, a sheet of music in front of you, but, that, but you really have to learn how to play it. And, and to really learn, you have to have a teacher. Even though it is written down, you are taught how to do it, orally, passed on to you. And so you may make a lot of notes to, know, to make sure that you're knowing how to do it correctly. This is now a close-up of my personal Taishikachu with my notes <laughs> all over it, okay? Um, and all these little marks um, are as way of, they have a meaning as to how to recite the Dharani. For example, we're taught how each beat in a certain cadence is either one or two syllables. Um, then we, you have to, uh, then you have to mark where to group or to leave solo each character. You can see how the first two characters in the upper right are circled. That's Namo. You don't recite it namo, it's recited namo. Now, personally, it, you know, so you can see that's namo, then the next one are grouped together, that's bhagya, bate, 
E. So there's uh, they're gathered in the first two, the second two, the third two, and then one is a single syllable circle, right? You can see that. So now, personally, if that wasn't enough, I can't chant katakana fast enough. So this is the rest of my page that I cut out in order to zoom, zoom yeah. in. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. I get it. But no, but look at the bottom, uh, bottom right, especially. Uh, if you can see it, uh, that's where I start writing my first line, namo bhakya. Obviously, it, it's a bit chaotic. But I wanted to at least show some of what a Durrani is like. Frankly, all that writing in the margins, that was just so that I could get through Japanese Go without messing it up for the rest of the, for the rest of the participants. You know, we chant at speed. And if, and if one beat is off, it can really be felt within the group. And if I misread the katakana, it's noticeable. Besides, I had to keep up, so I put it into the Roman letters. You, you do what you got to do. <laughs> it may look like a mess, but yeah, you know, I, I know how to go. Yeah, that's what's going on. Okay, so now that we've looked at that, um, I wanted to provide a way to hear it, so I might as well do it. Um, I'll get to it. So I'll recite the title and then uh, get it now. Please, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to stumble. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I apologize in advance. Let's, let's get into it. Okay. Bucho sancho darani namo bhagavate tari yuroka harichi bishi bhushutaya bodaya bhagavate tanya tao bishutaya bishutaya sama 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 nda bhapasa swaraji kacha kakada sopa bhishuti abhishin chataman sakita paravashana merita bhisegi magamandara hadai akara akara sandarani shudia shudia kakana bishude ushanita bhijaya bhijude Sakasara Nishumi, San Soji, Sariba, Tatikata Barakani, Shatahara Vita Hare Kurani, Sariba, Tatikata Giri Taya Tijudana, Tijudita Makabura De, Basara, Kayaso, Katana, Bishude, Sariba, Baratavaya, Dorakaji, Hari Bishude, Hari Chini Baritaya, Yukushide, Samayan, Tijudite, Mani Mani Makamani, Mani Mani. Makamani Tatata, Vodako, Chi, Hari Shude, Bizo, the Bo, Tishu, Jaya, Jaya, Bijaya, Bijaya, Samara, Samara, Sariba, Voda, Tishu, Tishu, Majori, Basara, Basara, Gerube, Sarura, Basaran, Babato, Mamashori, Ran, Sariba, Sataban, Shakaya, Hari Bashi, Bashi, Ishu, De, Sariba, Gatita, Shude, Sariba, Tatikata, Shisha, Me, Samashiba, Sa, and Do, Sariba, Tatikata, Samashiba, Sa, Shishu, Shiti, Boja, Boja, Biboja, Biboja, Bodaya, 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 Samantha, Hari Shudi, Sariban, Tatigata, Giri, Daya, Chishu, Dana, Jishu, Jita, Maga, Boda, Re, Suwaga. Bravo. <clears throat> so again, I told you I was going to stumble. Uh, but now I, I wanted to present, like, a, I have a sound recording of a group doing it. Um, and uh, I just picked one of the interwebnet. Um, and uh, so, but I picked one that was going to be uh, Bajagara Guru, the um, medicine Buddhist, since it's our hands on. Um, and so I'll have you, can you just play, and we'll probably have to skip ahead just a little bit, but I want to, at least, it's a little slower, but um, the influence of chanting it in a group, I hope, comes across. Yeah. A little So uh, here I, I want to kind of particularly point out 
that this particular Durrani has elements of the Yakshin Yore mantra. Om Bajja Je, Bajja Je. That's Om Bise Ze, Bise Ze. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So uh, this is where this is where what's interesting how we define uh, Durrani again. They blur very interestingly with mantra, which is a uh, Okay. Now, again, these Durrani, uh, yeah, that's it. These Durrani can be found everywhere throughout Buddhism. Think about the, uh, I, I, I often think of the Prajnaparamita, the Heart Sutra. Um, gati gati pada gati pada sam gati bodhisattva. That mantra encapsulates the teaching. We may know the translation, gone, gone, gone beyond, gone completely beyond awakening, so be it. But does that tell you what it means? Maybe only after studying the heart surgeon does the mantra start to have greater impact on someone, but its, it's use and understanding does not necess necessitate it. And merit and, and benefit can still be generated. The Lotus Sutra, Ends the, it ends with an entire chapter called Dharani. The, in the preceding chapter, chapter 25 of the Lotus Sutra, the cry regarder, it basically says, contemplate Avalokiteshvara and, and no harm will come to you. Contemplate compassion, be imbued with it, and things will change around you. Tiantai Master Juyi mentions it in uh, the use of Dharani in his Makashikam, the uh, Moho Jirguam. Just last week, Maxime gave a presentation on the Bodhisattva precepts, and in the presentation, he's describing the admonition about killing, for example. So, and I quote from the sutra, my disciples, if you yourself kill or incite someone else to kill, or you participate in the planning of a killing, or praise killing, or enjoy seeing someone kill, or kill by magical spells, then you have the causes of killing and the conditions of killing, the methods of killing, etc. The very next one, Quote, my disciples, you should know not to yourself steal, incite others to steal, or steal through deception. If you engage in the causes of stealing, the conditions of stealing, the planning of stealing, the act of stealing, or stealing through magical spells, <laughs> and so on, up to stealing the property of blah, 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 blah. Okay, granted, it, <laughs> I cannot ultimately say that the Durrani are the same as what they're saying is spell here in this particular situation, but all I'm saying is that the concept uh, of performing magic as a, it was a very real thing. It's got to be, it, it, it was in the presence enough to have it kind of mentioned specifically. I, I bring this up because it was not extraordinary to include Durrani. They have been commonplace. It was not something mystical. Their use is literal, not metaphorical. We may only um, see them in this way due to our perception and the words we use to describe them, which has been sullied by history. We think of getting, going through how we, our, our perceptions veiled by the Renaissance or Cartesian thinking or the, advance, uh, the advent of scienceism or modern, trend, modern postmodern trends of thought. These Durrani have been relied upon trusted, used, and passed on. One would, not, uh, one would not do that if they didn't do something. Yes, they were used in many different ways and for many different reasons. Some of those seem really foreign to us, seem improbable, maybe even impossible. But what seems to be is not always what is. Our definitions and presumptions might mischaracterize Durrani's intended use. We have ideas of what magic is, what prayers achieve, or what spells are. And they are usually a sleight of hand way, if I could use the pun, of dismissing the outcomes of that spell or prayer. Trying to instead logic or reason our way to an answer that is anything but something extraordinary happened. We have to stretch our understanding of the world, get outside of our own perceptions and biases about 
what Durrani can actually do. So when I use the word magic, I'm explicitly speaking to actually changing the world through reciting spells. I say this because at their foundation, Durrani imbue the practitioner with a remembrance of the teaching. Like applying the medicine of the Buddha Dharma to our poisons. That changes things. Period. Ryoko Oda puts it really well in his book, Kaji, uh, Empowerment and Healing in Esoteric Buddhism. Um, he puts it this way, quote, every person has extraordinary powers far beyond what is normally thought within the limits of human capability. This power is unrelated to electromagnetism emanating from the palms of the hands. It is not a force related to possession by supernatural uh, entities, and it, is, and it has nothing to do with psychokinesis. This power is held by those who realize a state of enlightenment realized by Shakyamuni Buddha, as well as those who strive in their lifestyles to understand how and uh, understand and know the truth he discovered, as well as by those who strive in their lifestyle to understand and know the truth. We are perpetually veiled. We have an infinite capacity for delusion. And the use of Durrani can get us out of that. We hear the use of these spells, quote unquote, throughout the sutra and just gloss over it as, as just all oh, one of those things we did in the past. That was a long time ago. However, I have brought this up before and, and it merits reiterating, things don't last if they don't work. I get asked all the time as an acupuncturist, oh, really? Does it work? <laughs> I get it. It's foreign. It's different. It seems like magic. Or maybe at least a placebo, whatever. But to me, it, it feels like it negates two to 3,000 years of history. Because, yeah, it still works. It it's works through empiricism. If we start to question that, chi or ki or energy or what have you, that... That kind of undermines feng shui, qigong, tai chi, kung fu, all the martial arts, etc. That's a lot. A lot of early Asian science was that empiricism. Does it work? Yep. Great. Do it again. Nope. All right. Well, try this. That Buddhist practices were no different. During my whole series last year about uh, the talking about the migration of Buddhism across East Asia, I hope I conveyed the very fact that many practices, ideas, theories, they would all arise, were tried out, or carried on, or not. We covered a lot of the ideas and practice that did get carried on. And I would argue that that is only because they did something. We could argue what that something is, granted. But nevertheless, we cannot trust our perception. We are trying to get out of conceptual thinking. However, the use of certain words can leave us biased about what Durrani are, what they're doing, and what they can achieve. One should experience them authentically, without bias as a way to get to some sort of point of understanding and to elicit some sort of transform transformative process. Thank you so much. Um, I'll open it to questions and comments, but I'll first ask uh, Ichishima Sensei and Monchin Sensei, do you have anything you would like to add about Dorani? Oh, thank you. Uh... Dharani is to hold uh, mystic things and uh, everything. Uh, that is Dharani. And uh, contrasting to Dharani, there is a word mantra. What is the difference between the mantra and Dharani? 
it's a mantra is rather short uh, short uh, expressions while the uh, dharan is rather longer longer uh, statement uh, that uh, means various what should i say esoteric powers in it so uh, as you mentioned in the uh, talk that uh, in the heart sutra the last uh, part gati gati paragati parasangati bodhisvaha this is uh, of course mantra or dharani or maybe mantra i should say this is a uh, uh, you see we cannot express any uh, everything as it is so but dharani or mantra includes such a invisible uh, empowerment so uh Xuanzang, when he traveled to India from China, uh, he may, uh, came across various experiences, sometimes very frightening or very hard to trip. But um, in the hard, uh, hardest time, he said, Gati Gati, Para Gati, Para Sangati, Bodhisvaha. Then uh, that helped him to go ahead, uh, to go on living uh, or more fighting. So I think uh, Dharani and uh, uh, Mantra is kind of beyond uh, theoretical expression, but uh, it's very important. That is my feeling. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sensei. Thank you, Sensei. I'm going to pass and leave it open to questions. You did a good job. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, let me go so ahead. We'll stop the recording here. And